Our next topic is be our demo. George Taylor from Kerrville is going to do bottle stoppers. All righty. Okay, quick background. Uh, again, George Taylor. I'm out of the Hill Country Turners, been president, or been an officer for seven of the eight years I've been with the club. So i uh, been president for the last three through the pandemic. Uh, been turning for about 15 years. Uh, been in San Antonio since 09. Uh, and I've, I've it's been the longest we've been to any one place <laughs> in my career. Uh, through I did 40 years with AT&T, Southwestern Bell, and the whole gamut through divestiture and wireless and all those other fun topics that I don't have to deal with anymore. And uh, we're going to talk tonight about pin turning. I mean, not pin turning, but the bottle stoppers. Pin turners group, but doing bottle stoppers. I started out... Uh, was indoctrinated into wood turning by turning a pin. I uh, was up in Dallas, living there at that time, and uh, Hunt County Group was turning pins for soldiers. Uh, a lot of y'all remember that thing that was going on during the desert storm and, and the like, and I was doing flat work and making Adirondack chairs and uh, went into one of my favorite little wood stores up in McKinney, Texas, and the Hunt County Group was laid out there with a couple mini lays making pens for soldiers and they challenged me to make a pen and then the addiction began so uh been turning since ever since then uh started with pens uh i've grown i've grown away from pens uh i'm really a bowl and decorative bowl turner but i always kept the bottle stoppers as sort of my diversion uh, to me, it's my mindless turning for the most part. And so, a matter of fact, I gave a goodie bag over there of pen blanks to, for your raffles in the f to either today or in the future. So, uh, good riddance. Let, let other people use them because they were just gathering dust at my place. I'm not giving away the mandrels because I still make ornaments with them, but uh, I'll, I'll gladly give up the blanks. So... Tonight we're going to try and turn three different bottle stoppers, three different types of wood. Uh, the first one I'm going to do a traditional wood bottle stopper. Uh, I was going to let y'all pick which of the three woods, but I think I'm sort of leaning toward olive since it's so forgiving. But uh, we'll talk about that in a minute. Then I want to turn an acrylic, and I do. I turn acrylic, a completely different tools and sanding, and well, it really doesn't need finishing, but it does need buffing. And then uh, last time I was with you over at your place, Jim, w when I was doing the square plates, I also brought these up for your discussion. And what these are, are Wendell bought a box of these, and these are discarded cores from people cutting out bracelet blanks. And so he, 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 we were looking at them in his shop one day, and I said, can I have a couple of these? Let me see what I can do with them. And what I was able to do with them, some of them were only this thick, and some of them were thick enough that I could make a blank out of them, and they turned out like this. Because he was using exotic woods when he was pouring these acrylics. So uh, all I had to do is figure out how to deal with the hole. And that's what, that's what I brought up when we had the demo. So I'm hoping to do those. Uh, the blanks I'm going to use for the acrylic, I'm, I'm going to cheat a little bit because I'm going to use Eugene Soto's blanks, which is done with Illumilite, which is significantly easier to turn than some of the other acrylics. Some of these acrylics are not very forgiving, and they come in all different types. And the deals with the acrylics, and we'll get into this, is, is an issue called fracturing and uh, we'll talk about that when we get to it so I'm usually f a fast talker but uh, I don't know know if I'm a fast turner but there's all kinds of different materials to use uh, this is another one of Eugene's 
things that turns out really, really gorgeous. He can put all kinds of stuff in, in epoxy. It's amazing what he can do. He, one of my favorites is he had a white epoxy that he was putting glass shards in, and it was just outrageously gorgeous. Uh, and these are fun too, but you got to sand them well, uh, but they finish and they pop, they pop as well. This is the diamond wood, the colored, uh, colored plywood, and again, just different consistencies, different things. If you still have any of these left over, because they, they don't make them anymore as far as I could see, these are amazing if they turn, but they fracture terribly. So you've got to be... You got to be very careful and very patient when trying to turn these. Uh, when you get to acrylics, I, like I said, I do not use traditional tools with the acrylics. Uh, I use hunter tools to do the acrylics. You could use a skew, but I'm not proficient yet. Maybe before I go to the wood turning store up in the sky, I'll be able to turn with a skew. Well, but anyway. Uh, Pricing, I used to be in a gallery. It gets to be a challenge trying to sell bottle stoppers in a gallery, especially if you're using the Niles stoppers cause, uh, and you're using acrylics because you're already over 10 bucks in material cost as it is. And at most galleries, you're at a minimum of 40% commission rate. So a, a $25 price point only going to get you 14 bucks back. 13, 14 bucks. Uh, when I was in, in a gallery up in Fredericksburg, mainly to do my bowls, this was sort of a sideline. They were priced at 35 and they hardly moved. So the sweet spot, I think, on bottle stoppers is when they can give you a 20 or 25 at the, at the, at the top end. So friends and family, it works out great. $20 bill, they go home with a stopper and they're happy and I'm happy. But... Uh, if you're ever going to display them, I don't know if you go this far, but this is a chunk of mesquite I didn't know what to do with, so I just drilled holes in it, and at least my bottle stoppers didn't walk away very often. So, uh, unless someone wants me to use the redwood or the spalted pecan, I'd rather use the olive. <laughs> I am going to show you, there's... Uh, one thing I do is I prep the bottoms of all my bottle stoppers, and they're all prepped in the same manner. Uh, I, when I first started doing these, I, I was doing them on drill press, and I was having an issue because when I got all finished, and they were all threaded, and they were all turned, finished, polished, I'd stick them on the stopper, and they wouldn't sit flush against the bottom of the stopper. And I probably should have read somewhere about it first, but I figured out my own method on how I did it. And so I do all my drilling off the lathe, and I prep by turning a small concave area so that it will sit flush all the way around. So what I'm going to do first, and so I'm going to prep one. I'm, I've already prepped the others, so you don't need to see it mul multiple times. I'm going to... And this is just my Vigmark ch chuck with the shark jaws. And it just, I love this jaw. I mean, I use it for my small bowls. And because w on my Powermatic, with the new Powermatic that has even a more extended front, and with these jaws, I can get to the back of any bowl after I reverse it. Because uh, when you're reversing a bowl on a, on a tenon, it ne <laughs> at least my bowls never true up really well. <laughs> so it never hurts to have a final shear cut across the back to sort of true up the back, especially if you're trying to go ultra thin. But that's a digression on bowl. Okay, here's my drill. On my, on my bit, I have, a, I have it marked for my depth, and the depth matches the threading here. It's actually a little bit deeper. So the one thing I don't know is how do you lock the how do you lock this? It will not lock. See the red button there? That's the lock. That's your spindle lock, but there's no you have to hold it. 
Okay. okay. I'll figure that out. Okay. Uh, it helps when I'm threading to lock it in a little bit. Okay. So, okay. So, luckily, this is fairly lined up on my center point, so I just tighten her down. Okay, there's my mark. It's right in front of me so I can see. Let me lock this down. And then we start her up. Okay, power on. Doesn't need to go fast. 600 RPMs is plenty. And we're going to start going in. Olive is so nice. Don't let my elbows poke into that thing. It hurts. And you gather a lot of gadgets. You know that from the pen turning. This is my threading tool. And so basically, I, I shouldn't say basically. Judge Judy would jump at me. I, I used to do this with a, with a uh, handheld drill, but I ended up ripping all the threads out. So... I, I just do it this way. It goes fairly fast. On the acrylics, it can get a little tight. That's when I use two hands and have the spindle locked <laughs> on my Powermatic. No. Now, there is a topic that I talked about before uh, that... These are not only bottle stoppers, they're cabinet doorknobs. You, from Granger, you can buy step downs that'll take this from a 3 8 to a quarter inch threading. And it's a little thread thing, and it, I think it's 10 bucks for a pack, probably a packet of 25 or 50. And it's still a little bit bigger than the standard cabinet screw, but a half inch will work, especially my shop cabinets and shop drawers. So all my sh a majority of my shop drawers and shop cabinet doors have bottle stopper <laughs> doorknobs, all different colors. So and while I was saying all that, I, f I finished that. And usually, if you saw the picture on the website, I usually do these at a minimum five at a time. And I have a little hanging thing right next to my lathe that I screw them up while especially the wood ones while the finish is drying, which usually takes a couple hours, and then I can buff them. Uh, oh, shoot, I didn't mean to. I didn't do it. Thank you. I get talking, and I can realign it easily. You get talking, and you forget. Okay, it's just standard spindle gouge. Still a little high. I know, I gotta turn it down. Gotta go the other way. Okay. Try this again. That should be all it's needed. I don't know if you can see, but you double check it by seeing there's a little space in between there. I could probably go one more. It does not hurt to go a little deeper. Okay, that's definitely got it now. Now you can see the gap, hopefully. Uh, I don't know if yeah, you got it. Okay, shows overhead, okay. All right, so that's all I wanted to show you is how I approach getting the bottom ready. Um, 
that's all we're going to that's all I need the Vic mark for tonight this is a bill like chuck that just has the mandrel in there I said bill like because you don't need to spend the two or three hundred bucks for a bill collet system for doing this I had a bill collet system and sold it because it was a waste of money when you can get this one I think it was at Penn State for half the price and it stays that locked in just like that and then we just hopefully everything screws on yeah, there we it's collet chuck it's got a little collet that I bought separately that goes right into it and you just sort of gather things little tip and trick especially if you turn bottles tighten it untighten it Oops, except you got to keep the collet chuck in there do it a couple times otherwise you will not have to get your channel locks to take it off after it's all finished and sanded and especially when you got a nice acrylic piece that you've gotten all the fractures out of it you do not want to that's that's that gets sad any questions please feel free to ask I'll try and answer and now this is it's just by eye it's just enough to where I can see space and that's all I'm really looking for now there will be instances uh, after the threading depending on your wood that it, if it's if it spins on you that means the threading did not take real well you can go back and fix it uh, the threading by taking it off getting what I use is a medium CA glue to sort of coat the inside and then rethread it again and then usually that second time it will give you sharp enough edges that it will catch uh, okay where was I so I'm gonna standard rough and gouge to bring it round and then I'm just going to be using spindle gouges to get the design I want and then I'll have a couple specialty tools we might have some fun with this is so quiet it's nice it's nice I know you're not supposed to do this, but all I'm trying to do is get it to round. When I first started turning these, I used to get all kinds of weird shapes and designs, and I had one that looked like a top hat. I had another one that I did my version of the Three Mile Island smokestacks, and then I got to the point, we're just looking for a knob. You're just looking for a knob that you can grasp and pull out. And I may do some things with the wooden ones, like you'll see in a minute with beading tools and the like. But the acrylics, if it's a good acrylic, it speaks for itself. You don't need to do much more than make it a knob because they're going to ooh and ah over the material. And even this uh, olive, I mean, that is a beautiful piece of wood. I, I mean, I just love olive. Not only because it t turns and sands and finishes so well, but it is gorgeous. Thing, if you never turn bottle stoppers, don't try to make them too tall. Because if you do, they don't fit in the refrigerator. <laughs> Unless you're getting the Niles bottle stopper, that's the bottle opener. Well, then you need a full hand worth to open up your Dos Equis. So, yeah, the, the bottle stoppers are not just for bottles anymore. They're, I mean, for wine bottles anymore. Uh, and you shouldn't call them wine stoppers anymore. You need to call them bottle stoppers because all of these fancy crafts they have for oils and the olive oils and the like, same basic opening. 
Uh, I know some of the makers of them now are making them for whiskey bottles, which is a little bit wider opening. So, uh, and they still have all the same threading, so your tooling doesn't change. Yeah, that's the biggest thing. People think they're so cute, so cute, saying, my bottle never gets in. Uh, there's never anything left. I mean, you don't know how many times I've heard that. Because uh, when, I, when I was at the gallery, they had these first Fridays. Okay, I'm going to a spindle gouge and start to do a little shaping. Starting to tape, taper the back end. And it's just standard spindle gouge. Uh, it's it's a little bit by side. You can buy a, the washers, but uh, I generally go by that, and I usually try and turn it in just to hair, just to get. I do better sometimes than others. <laughs> so, but on most of them, and you can pass a couple of these around. I here's one that I did fairly well on turning it in on the acrylic, and then I'll I'll send one around that I didn't do very well. <laughs> so. That one I could have done better on turning it in. So yeah, I usually do it by eye. And just, I, I, there's times when I've tried to go straight into what I think the width of the stopper bottom is. And that doesn't, I mean, that's, that's sometimes a crapshoot. <laughs> so I'd rather just get it close and then give it a little bit of a round over. And it's, it, se it seems to flow better in there. Most of my wine stoppers now are, since I've gotten out of the gallery after the pandemic, are a friends and family type thing uh, on a lot of things. I, I, during the pandemic, I got a new toy and I've been playing with it a lot more. I got a CNC machine. So I've been having, as my buddy Wendell knows, I've been having a lot of fun with it. <laughs> It's all about the fun. Now I'm just trying to roll it over. I'll get a smaller uh, gouge in a minute. Let's start rounding this off. I don't know if any of y'all do, but I got a wife that complains at times. And she always complained when I turned my stoppers with a point. She's always afraid someone's going to slap their hand down. And so, honest to God, I don't do them at a point anymore. It's marital bliss. Even though she'll never, you'll never catch her in the shop. But I am fortunate that her hobby is more expensive than mine, so she never questions my, pur my purchases. <laughs> Horses. <laughs> yep, so enough said. <laughs> so, yeah. Not just one, though. She has to have three. And I only have one lathe. Well, two if you could count my mini. No. No, she, she, we used to. She had a rescue that was getting ready to go to the fa uh, factory because it had a splayed leg and she rescued it and I'll never I'll never diss her for that because it was one one beautiful little horse that would have been abused so I'm sort of getting the shape I'm looking for I can go a little bit thinner not a bad shape is there any problem with me sanding in here okay this is just a little bit smaller detail gouge Thompson all I'm trying to do is get behind here and continue to roll it over and that needs a little bit of work uh. 
This is still a little thick for my taste. But this is where you can have some fun. This is what I, I consider the mindless part. Because there's no rules. There's nothing I'm trying to duplicate. I'm just doing beads and coves. I have. I have. But practicing my skew skills at this point is still from a, a single long piece of <laughs> yard mesquite. Uh, again, this is... Okay, uh, that's not a bad shape. Now let's have some fun. You're familiar with D-Way tools, everybody? This is their beading tool. I'll pass it around after I finish because I'll only bead on the, well, I, I got one little thing to t turn over. It's a little rough. Okay, that's not bad. That'll clean up with sanding. Okay, we got to change this. Uh, there we go. That's out of the way now. That needs to go up a little bit. Everyone used beading tools before? This one's cool because I like having both edges. And you don't need to do a bead all the time either. Grooves are cool too. S grooves are really cool, especially when you wire burn them in black. Is that little Tony? And now the most illuminating thing to do is sand. And you know you're getting old when you pull them all out at once so you know which one was the last one you used. Don't need it. Don't need it. Hey, on my bowls, sometimes I do. You must have... When I sand, I usually fold them in half. I seem like I can get into crevices a little bit easier. And then, and then I got both, both sides to sand with. Then I know I go to the, this is 150 through 600. When I was doing a lot of these, I always watch for the woodcraft sales on those boxes, then buy two. And I use these for both wet sanding, the acrylics, which I will do, as well as dry sanding. And if you, how many of you have wet sanded before? Okay, good portion of you. Some people are a little hesitant about it. I mean, I even wet sanded some of uh, my uh, bowls that I do in uh, with lacquer. And uh, James Johnson swears by that. It's finishing the finish, uh, wet sanding. And uh, he gave us a whole paper on wet sanding and you can tell by the difference in some of his box elder pieces what the wet sanding does. And then I guess it was, I name dropped because I, I had a habit or I was encouraged. How many of you know John Horn up in, from North Texas? Gentleman, old gentleman, looks like Santa Claus, has been around SWAT forever. 
you know, you know who John is. He taught me. He taught me to turn. He used to do uh, evening wood turning classes three weeks in a row, one night, to teach you how to wood turn. And then off your merry way you'd go. But he pulled me aside because he knew I was addicted. And he said, George, if you can afford it and you have the time, you should do a, wood, a, a workshop a year. You need to go somewhere, take a workshop. It'll improve your skills. You'll get to meet people. You'll get involved. And so I took him to heart. And I, got, I was very fortunate that my company made me travel. So I took advantage of the miles. And I, got a, I went on journeys every year. And I, I nicknamed it my sabbatical. But uh, point is, I, I learned a lot. And I learned a lot from some very qualified people. I made it one of my bucket lists at, at, at one point to go to every uh, uh, wood turning school that I could find out about. And so I went to, been to Aramont, but I, I try and pass on the tricks and tips I've learned, but I also want to tell the people I got them from. So you understand that when I talk about Nick Agar, I'm not trying to name drop Nick Agar. I'm trying to give him credit for what I learned. Uh, and so some of these things I've learned from different people. And we've been fortunate in our club, like y'all have, based on Majestic Ranch. Another thing to bring some very experienced turners in. And this is craft supplies, wood turning oil. That's all I do. Put a couple coats on. Wipe it off. Try not make too much of a mess that wood turners d usually make. And then that's it. And, and then I, if you saw on the website, I have a little hanging thing that I would go sit and hang for half a day till after lunch. And I would uh, then buff it out. And I'll buff these out tonight. But. I, that's why I love olive wood. And, oh, is that it? Oh, there we go. Oop. There we go. Mm -hmm. Okay. We'll save it for the... Uh, okay. So now for something completely... Any questions? Because now we're going to go do something completely different. Now you're getting ready to see ribbons instead of shavings. You notice that thing pulled off real nicely, unscrewed. Yeah. This is the one. You gotta be one. See, it's so tight it even pulled the chuck. Two. And sometimes you pull it off make sure everything's knocked out. <laughs> I, I, I love Ruth to death, and I always did, just for that reason. There's obviously, there's cheaper. Uh, Nick Cook, who sells a ton of wild soppers, he buys nickel and dime cork, and that's all he uses for his bottoms. And he, he has home, uh, he has wood on his house and cork stoppers, so his true material cost is probably under a buck. And that's why he can sell them for 15 to 20 bucks and still make, make a mint. But uh, if you get these in volume, I think you can get them under six bucks. Uh, volume being over 20 or 30, maybe it's six bucks. And jeans, acrylics are just absolutely fantastic, but they're not cheap. Uh, you get one of his blocks, you should be able to get three stoppers out of it which I think runs to about six to eight bucks per stopper. And so you're at 12 bucks, 10 to 12 bucks material cost for every, before you ever put your labor in. That's why I say uh, putting these in a gallery with these kind of materials is not a money-making oppor opportunity. Okay, so acrylics. Uh, you can buy the cheaper non 100% stainless stoppers for probably three or four bucks. But I like telling these people they're food grade stainless and they're never guaranteed for life and 
that kind of thing. Okay, you pay for what you get, but a lot of people don't care what you, what they get. They just want to don't want to pay for it. So acrylic, I will use the Thompson tools once I get this round. I'm not worried initially on fracturing, and you'll tell you'll know the difference. You'll hear the difference uh, when I start turning this thing, and it's going to sound very chattery and chippy as we first get started. Once I get close to round, I'll switch to one of the two hunter tools I've got. I've got the hunter hooked Hercules, which is the big mama that I can take a little bit heftier cut with. Yeah, you can see it there. And then I have the hunter Osprey. And what I like about these is they have this back to them. So it's a supported cut when you're doing these. It's not, the original hunter tools can be very grabby because they're not supported. These are supported, so you can almost treat them like a spindle gouge, a, ru a bevel rubbing cut. So uh, use a bowl gouge, spindle gouge, it doesn't matter. I'm just trying to get this thing off a of square. Let's see, make sure I'm not hitting. I like to turn away so that this stuff can be a pass with all these chips flying. Turning acrylics can be slow going because you can only take so much of a cut before you hear the dreaded sound. See, we're still not round yet. Now we're getting round. You can actually hear the difference. And there is a method to my madness of turning in this direction. If I turn in this direction, which you can do, look where all the things are going. And then you gotta stop it. I keep a pair of pliers here doing this just to do this. So, but you can already see where we're going with this thing. Again, I'm just doing a knob. And the hunter tool is just nice and supported. When I get to the osprey, I'll even be able to turn around this. There's the fracture. But I've still got a lot of material to take out, so I'm not as concerned because I'm pushing the tool a little hard because this is almost like sanding, you know, or hollowing. It can be real exciting. Yeah, I'm trying to get the... I find out when I demo this, I always make these so thick and fat because I'm tired. I, I don't want to bore you with me just taking more and more material off. Okay. Well, the <laughs> Any of y'all ever turn sassafras? Anyone turn sassafras? You know what that smells like? Yep, there you go. That is, that is an interesting one to do.
The challenge with the hunter tools is going around the corner. So you got to sort of inch up on it. Okay, I'm going to take a break from that tool because I. Where's Osprey's got a smaller cutter on it, which but also means I can get in tight here, and just rub that corner to give me that rounded corner. And I'll use that for my finishing cut too. And you see how it's starting to round? And I didn't bring my quarter inch gouge sometimes that I use to just try and really tuck that in. But you can see the level of sh the thickness of the shavings coming out of this smaller one. Did you ever buy these at SWAT? Where is he? Did you buy him? Oh, very good. <laughs> Did you buy these two? Or okay. Do you like it? <laughs> I was very fortunate in one of my ass many assignments that I was. I was assigned up in Minneapolis, St. Paul area, and for two reasons. Not only is that where uh, AAW's national headquarters is, but it's also where my Hunter is. And I got to meet him and spend time with him, and actually, he actually communicates when he's got new, new stuff coming. And he does do club orders, if y'all are interested. Drop my name, he'll know me. <laughs> no, nah, not, not lately. I haven't, I haven't done anything to really hack him off. Now, we, we, uh, when Johnny Tolly came and did his Halloween demo, uh, we put in a... Some, somewhere, somewhere between eight hundred to a thousand dollar order with Mike Hunter for his hollowing tools. So Mike knows me because I put the order in and I collected. That's the other thing about being president when no one else wants to. Right, Debbie? <laughs> See, I'm just taking it real easy, trying to ease this corner before I try and round it completely. You got to start with the corner and. Take a little more each time. And this is the big Hercules again. This is the first supported hunter cutter that he ever made. Now he even has a cutter that goes on my, uh, uh, my uh, coring system. That's one I bought I haven't tried yet. And I've had it for over a year, but don't tell my wife. Okay, that's a clean. When you hear that sound, that means I got something to clean up. Let's see if I can stop it and you can see it. Let's see. I don't really see a fracture, but I, it doesn't. It didn't sound good. And usually on this kind of stuff, you go by sound. I'm not getting bad fractures. If I'm getting anything, I'm getting micro fractures. And they usually show up after you're ready to polish them. And they're off the lathe. Do you, do you turn it faster or slower than wood? I don't, need, I don't know a difference. It depends on the material. If it's one of these like this that is very, very fractured, fracture, fr I'll turn it slower. Just trying to get an easy cut. This stuff from Eugene... I turn it as fast as I think I can. I want it. 
His stuff is just so friendly to turn. That alumilite is just amazing. I'm working my way around. I pr I'm practiced, so be be careful normally. Like I said, at home I've got <laughs> the last vestiges of my youth, my college youth, is some electronic needle nose pliers, and they're just perfect for that. That's all I've got left besides my diploma and my broken down slide rules. I was, pardon? Freshman year, they did not allow calculators until sophomore year. And uh, I won't even tell you what year that was, but you can get the hint. And all I can say is, thank goodness, TI was around with factory seconds. Because I went to a school where all the rich kids had their HPs. And, and if, you know, if you know about HP calculators, they were not cheap. I was fortunate. I was co-oping. Uh, anyone familiar with a co-op program? I... Uh, it's the only way I could graduate and pay my bills. So I co-opted uh, for five years. Uh, I got a four-year degree and got two and a half years of work experience on my credit because I stayed with the same company. So all these people, all these new hires were just totally upset with me because I had vacation the day I started after I graduated. And I didn't have a six-month waiting period for my health plan. Now, I graduated, but I had about 16 bucks in my checking account. Had to live at home for, six, for several months. <laughs> no, the Model T's were out of stock at that point. Tony, I did not expect it to you. And I've been and I've been holding back on the short jokes. <laughs> that is, I, I was trying to be a kind demonstrator, and you do this to me. Okay, I think we're. Get, you think you get the idea, the shape and the shavings and the like. We're fairly clean. Got a little ridges that'll that should sand out. Let's get this out of the way because the worst thing you can do is let this drop because it almost always drops right on the on the head and you you just lost the head the cutter okay I'm now moving to my high priced lathe cover via Amazon uh, we're, pardon exactly I already got a stock Paul Okay, pull out what I need. Uh, show you how I wet sand. Take a strip like this. Soak it. Soak it in the water. You also, to get started, on the first grit or two, you gotta, you got to moisten this. And I'm, oh, one other thing I'm going to need, I'm going to need a paper. Because after each grit, you need to wipe off the sludge because you don't want to be sanding sludge. So you're going to turn it back on. That's about right. Again, I sort of fold them in half. And if it sounds dry, you dip it. You want this thing to slide over the material. should start building a sludge. Like I said, the first grid is always the one you're going to continue to wet. Because if it, if, it's, if, it's, if it sounds like it's crackling and it's, it's dry, you want it almost spitting the wood, spitting at you.
See the sludge coming up? Okay. That's just part of the sludge. The rest of it is still on the stopper. As in all sanding, you always look after the first sanding, make sure you've gotten everything. Because for everything else, you're just taking out the scratch marks. Okay. It's pretty smooth, pretty smooth. Okay, that's one done. Let's go to the next. And, and stick it in the water. I will not stop the lathe on the rest of these. See, it's, it's holding the water now a lot better than after the first sanding. This is 240. That first one was 150. Just straight out of the Woodcraft or wherever I bought it. It could have been Rockler online. They sell these. They have these on sale every every once in a while too. If you don't know, Amazon Prime or Amazon carries Rockler, so you can order Rockler via Amazon on a lot of stuff. Since a lot of us don't go to stores anymore. Yeah. Well, when I was doing when I was doing flat work, they had some of the nicest jigs at a decent price like I got my bandsaw out feed table from them and stuff like that that would, they were good at about that kind of stuff because if you bought the OEM manufacturers ones boy they were pricey yeah they weren't the rocket one wasn't as substantial but I wouldn't a substantial woodworker so you can see the sludge now Wipe it off. It now, when I finish all the sanding, this is going to look fairly dull. That's why I brought the, B, uh, the buffing system, because buffing and acrylics are critical. So you can get it wet. And it'll, it's, it's such a neat thing to, to do that after, uh, to buff the acrylics, because they just go from flat to polished and nothing. Okay. Get the sludge off. No, I haven't because this is what I've been using for 10 years and I don't stop. Uh, there's always something new. I mean, I had those micro mesh pads for, for the longest time, especially with doing pins but when i buff them i mean you can't tell any difference you can't and i've got the buffing bill buffing for the mandrel one i keep on my mini lathe, my mini lathe and then i have the individual wheels i was fortunate enough he was still around when don pencil was making those extensions on your lathe that would have them and I jealously guard that one of mine because he doesn't he isn't around anymore and doesn't make them. Of course you could make your own, but I'd rather turn or do my CNC or do fun stuff. I know you were watching me seeing if I did that. <laughs> well, he's the only one that'll speak up. <laughs> Nick will. Nick will let me know. I was demoing in uh, uh, Baltimore at that Baltimore club that's in the back where that woodcraft is and I was doing a natural edge bowl and I said I did my safety spiel of turning off you know you're supposed to turn off the lathe I mean turn off this yeah turn off the lathe when you're moving your tool rest and then spin it around once before you turn it back on and I had a guy in the peanut gallery that would just wait for me not to do those three steps all in a row to remind me. And then... Oh. <laughs> oh, missed. I shouldn't go out for the spurs. Yes. Oh, I thought you said George, and I said, uh-oh, I'm in trouble. So... Turn it off. I'm about ready to slide. Again, it looks dull. Let's see. Okay. Oh, you can see it fairly well here. Let's see. There we go. 
but wait till I wait till it polishes. How are we doing on time? We doing real good? Okay, good. So there's number two. We'll go to number three. Not a drop. All right. Okay. Now we're going to try this jewel right here. This is, again, one of those cord out things. And I, I put this together today. I use CA glue, which probably epoxy would be better, but I'm lazy. Uh, and all I did was to align it was to use, well, I'll show you in a minute. Screw this on. First, I turned the bottom like I did the other, did all the other bottoms I talked about today, this today. And then I was ready to glue it up. I made sure I had a good flush face to it. So, which take it to your belt sander, just make sure it's flat. Took the side of it that was the flattest on these, and one side has, I noticed, was cut real flush. If you want to pass that around. It's real flush. And so I did, I put CA glue on that side, put it in here, because I'm not concerned that the two holes line up. I'm concerned that this hole is at the center, so when I put my little medallion in, it's all centered, ready to go. And so I put my CA glue, have something down here to protect the lathe, go sit, go sit around for, well, actually, I spritzed the outside with the hardener, but I know not to turn it immediately because that does not harden the glue that's on the inside. So you got to let it all sit and percolate an hour, probably no more than that, and then it's ready to go. But I did this today. Now, this will all be trued up and rounded, and even if the, this line is not perfect, it only looks not perfect when it's spinning on a lathe. And actually an angle would probably be cool in some ways if it was really acute, but what, I'm, what I've done is I, when I, I'm going to use this to hold it in because the glue joint of CA is not the best. So it's not going anywhere like that. I'll round it, shape it, and then take this off only when I'm addressing that very bit, that front. So I've had it fall apart on me. So buyer be warned. I think Jim, Jim, and Jim might be the only one that might catch a piece, but I don't think that's going to happen. So, <laughs> so I'm back to my spindle gouge because I'm just going to rough it out, round it out. Let's turn it because it. No, uh, no, I, I threaded this piece first because I wanted it mounted here for alignment reasons. So I threaded, I threaded it like I did on my chuck, mounted it here, glued it together with this pushing and forcing it to be in the center point. Now those two, like I, I was trying to indicate, those two centers are not lining up and I don't care. But you can do this with anything that's been bored through the center. You know, if you over, uh, if you over, you know, screw too deep, this is also a solution for that, not the glue up part, but aligning it this way. If you screw too deep, you can still do what I, what these little jewels are, because this is, this was the moment that put it all together. Uh, was it 499? For 25 pieces, this is all of 2.99, <laughs> and as you can see by the ones that were passed around, they do set it off. And you could say I put Savarsky crystals in there. Not really, but anyway, uh, where was I? Yeah, I think I was going to turn. Instead of running my mouth.
And you can see the effect. I think you can see some of the uh, fractures coming up in here and we'll work on it and uh, but you can see at the bottom people are going to look at it people are going to look at this they're going to ooh and ah over the uh, epoxy because these things came with some very nice exotics so let's go to my big hunter matter of fact let me go stay here and finish this the wood portion down here okay I'm, I'm gonna need to go back to that after I get some of this away now we're gonna work on isn't that cool the way that thing just fly, flies? <laughs> I can, but I, I usually don't. That vacuum system I got, I got one of the jet canister vacuums and it's loud. I'd rather have music playing. My sanding, I usually have my jet vacuum going with, I got a air cleaner above my, above my lathe and a vacuum right on this side of it and when I'm doing heavy sanding especially on my bowls I have that thing going and I I two-stage the vacuum with one of those trash can separators and it makes a huge difference in in 10 years I have not emptied the bag yet off my dust collector with that separator now the bag's getting a little heavy I'd, I'd hate to I mean, I may need Wendell to come help me lift it and change it. And the other sad part is I don't know where the spare bags are <laughs> at this point after 10 years. And I find the acrylics that are mixed with wood like Eugene does and like this is, they are significantly more forgiving. And I don't know if it's because they all use aluminite or something that's friendlier or not but they turn very nicely I'm gonna have to go with it I need to move this closer I know I'm supposed to turn the lathe off but I, did, I didn't attest that I was going to do that, this, this one, like I did in. This is sort of taken in stages because the wood part, you really need to take it off with a gouge. It's so much easier. And I want to get, I want to get this down to my final depth, and I'll get my smaller gouge to do that. I should lock it. Maybe that'll help. Hunters work with wood as well, but again, you're, you can take a heftier cut with a, on wood with a standard gouge. <laughs> and now I have to turn it off. That's the downside of having to use a tailstock. Oh, I lost it. See, I knew that could happen. Okay. Next time I'll do, we'll go with epoxy. Uh, it probably had too much friction with one of the cuts. So you got the concept. <laughs> you can have this. <laughs> but I've been successful with these and then unsuccessful. So I thought I'd owed it to you since I showed you, I posed the problem last time I was with you. This part stayed well. 
and I'll probably try and glue it back up and do it again with epoxy. <laughs> but uh, I can do that. I mean, I'm I'm doing pours with epoxy now, so. But that's what happened, and. How many are familiar with Arizona Silhouette? Okay. They changed owners about 10 years ago, I think. And it was right in the middle of the time when I was doing Bottle Stopper, so it was great. They were selling this little jewel, for, I think, for 15 bucks. Now, you can make your own. You've got a little rubber washer, same threading as your Bottle Stoppers. But sure, get your fingers out of the way. So, but you got you got to hold a certain way, otherwise you can unspin it. And <laughs> How do I know that? So, so, real simple. Just hold it on this. I do these five or ten at a time. It, Set it up on one speed, triple E, white diamond, canoe oil, that's dust coming off, it's been sitting in the shop. And then I start at the top, start running it around slowly. And I get my fingers really close, the, except for the Triple E. The Triple E can smart. And always use your fingers to touch, because you got two or three. Now, go to the white. The IQ of this group is so significantly higher than ours. So what speed do you keep up at? Uh, this one's set at 1800 and it's, it's usually on my mini lathe which is, I get something around 900 to 1000. Oh, uh, one other thing I do, I forgot. I usually always do the bottoms first. Just being a little anal, I want to make sure the edges are all polished. I swear the olive sometimes doesn't even need to be po <laughs> doesn't even need finish on it. But you can see I can do five or ten of these in 15, 20 minutes. That's why I have that little storage thing that they just don't hang. They hang, but they don't hang around on a top on a tabletop somewhere to get knocked over. This Tripoli just really does amazing things to the acrylic. Okay, I'll pass this around with this little wand in case anyone's curious. Did you ever find out what kind of finish that was? Is it just a friction polish? I didn't think so. I mean, I think I looked at it at one point and was curious myself, because is it anything different than the Mylans? And people swore by this stuff. Uh, it's 
It's one of it's my go-to finish for the bottle stoppers. I have three finishes I use otherwise. I use Mahoney's for utility finish. I use uh, if it's a, a a solid wood or with no decoration, no treatment or anything. I use what they call a Minwax Antique Oil. It's a Danish-like oil. It's a little bit thicker cons consistency than the Danish oil, and it polishes up real nice. I use, but use typically th three coats, let it sit for 24, 48 hours, and then buff it for, my wood, for wood items. And I used to use Danish oil, and I, I did a whole questions and exploration on finishing, and I was lucky enough that I was on Facebook with... Uh, and friends with Betty Scarpino, and I always loved the finish on her wood pieces. And she t put me onto this antique oil. You can't find it at the big box stores. It, you won't find it at Lowe's. You will not find it at Home Depot. You will find it at True Value. And True Value will order it for you. So it comes in a reddish can, and it's Minwax, which is a major brand, and it's called their antique oil. So I use that for my wood pieces, like natural edge bowls and the like. And for stuff that I uh, airbrush or use the Chroma Gilt products or Chroma Craft products, that's, uh, I, I, will, I will go with lacquer. And I will, I'll do rattle can lacquer. I, I've been going on the Chroma Craft rattle can lacquer. Is there something up? Oh, okay. I use the Chroma Craft lacquer, but I use several rattle can lacquers and do about 10 coats of that, or I do five coats of that, then wet, wet sand to 1,000 to 1,500 grit, two or three more coats. And one thing I learned from Jimmy Clues is that's not a finish yet. It's not, you got to finish the finish. And that's when he goes and he uses <clears throat> the Mylan, two Mylan's products that they use for auto industry. And that's what he puts the final polish with is the Mylan's not Mylans, uh, Meguiar's, I'm sorry, Meguiar's. I had Mylans on the brain from the other stuff. But he, he, he finishes stuff with the, with the Meguiar's. So I was asking all these people how they finish stuff because I couldn't get my finishes the way I wanted them. Word of it on Amazon is $19.39. for the antique stuff here. Minwax, yeah. It's, like I said, I, I like it. Uh, I, I, uh, I just did an ambrosia maple platter, and, you know, ambrosia maple has those little pecky holes in it, so I have crushed turquoise, and so I, I did turquoise powder in all the little pecky holes, three, three coats of the Minwax oil, well, my other buffing, and 75 bucks later, it went to a friends and family. So uh, it's, it's, a, it's a nice finish. There's a, there's a buffing, there's a polish, and then there's the buffing compound. There's two bottles of it that you, that you buy. And uh, if I'm doing a nice, the only thing I do that's solid wood that I'll do lacquer on is like box elder. Because any finish, well, lacquer leaves the lightest finish on box elder, unless you bleach it. And I haven't gotten into bleaching yet. Uh, it, it'll, turn, it'll turn a darker tan. F you know, if box elder, when it's turned, finished turned, before you put any finish on it, is almost white. It almost has a holly look to it. But at the minute you put a finish on it, it starts turning tan. And I don't know if anybody's dealt with flaming box elder much. You know not to put it in, in the sunlight. Yep. It turns brown. And it's turned, if it's in direct sunlight, it could turn brown overnight or over, over a 24-hour period. <laughs> Not overnight, but over a 24-hour over a period, it can turn brown. Uh, I turned a box elder salad bowl for my wife before I knew about box elder. I was so excited. Gave her this beautiful red salad bowl. Six months later, it's a beautiful brown <laughs> salad bowl. And she still uses it but uh, it isn't as dramatic. And it's still a beautiful bowl. It still has beautiful figure. It's, the red is so rare in wood that it it's, it's dramatic. Uh, 
James Johnson, I don't know how many of you know James Johnson out of our club, uh, the father of SWAT, one of the fathers of SWAT, and he was at the, he was in, he was at the first AAW symposium ever. Uh, his member number is 110 or something like that. Uh, but anyway, he used to almost turn solid box elder, and the box elder pieces he still has in his possession are in a totally dark closet because he wants to retain the red as long as he can. And, uh, but he dyes a lot of his stuff. And so he, and he goes, he's just amazing lacquer finish on the dyeing. I don't know if you saw the piece we did on him that was in the AEW magazine about a year ago. Uh, uh, we, were, we were bound and determined to honor the man before he goes. And so we sent off I think eight to ten of his rough outs without him knowing it all across the country and uh, unfortunately during the pandemic we didn't have club meetings so uh, uh, club officer and I went to his place and presented him to him and he had pieces from Mahoney from clues from agar from David Ellsworth turned a hollow form for him which was the national turners and then we had Former, a, former SWAT presidents, Buddy Compton, uh, Janice Levi, the Tollies turned him a piece because we wanted to know, we wanted to let him know we appreciated him before it was, a, we wanted to, well, what did we call it? We wanted to give him a tribute before it became a memoriam. And so uh, we got a two-page spread in the AAW magazine on that, and it was, uh, pretty special he's still touched so anyway any questions any questions about turning any questions about Kerrville I'm the outgoing president and I'm happy to say outgoing